we are going to focus on multiple things that are all going to come together in a very beautiful way. And this coming Shabbat is actually, we are starting to read the Torah readings that lead us to Pesach. We are entering this Shabbat, we are blessing the month of Adar Bet, and we are starting to enter the season of redemption, the season of Geula, because the month of Adar is the month of Purim, and beginning, preparing us also to the month of Nisan, so this is the month of our ultimate redemption of Egypt. So the Torah readings, there are four Torah readings that we read in the next two months leading to Pesach. And each one of the Torah readings are particularly separate from the Parsha of the week. So this week's Parsha, we're going to take out two Torahs out of the ark. We're going to take out one Torah to read the portion of the week, Parsha's Vayakel. And we will also take out a second Torah to read Parshas Shekalim. So the four Parshas, quite interesting. Some of them are actually a biblical obligation to listen to. For example, the Shabbos before Purim, we're going to read the reading about Amalek, the war of Amalek. That reading is a biblical command to those who are capable to go to synagogue, have to go and listen to the reading and follow each word carefully. It's a mitzvah from the Orisa, it's a, it's a Torah command to remember Amalek, and that mitzvah is accomplished by listening to the reading of the Torah. But this week is the first one of the four, it is the week of reading Parshat Shkalim. Shkalim, this is the reading where we read about the commandment of every Jew donating a half a shekel. And Moshe was commanded by God, as we learned previous week, after the sin of the golden calf, Moshe was told by God to collect a half a shekel from every Jewish man over the age of 20. And until the age of 50, Every Jewish man, 600,000 men, each one of them gave a half a shekel. And that half a shekel would go for the silver that is being used for the sockets that held the beams of the tabernacle. This becomes a commandment for future generations as well. That this time of the year, um, we have an obligation to give the half a shekels, the machatzit a shekel. And in the times of the temple, from the first day of the month of Adar, the court is announcing that every person should come and bring a half a shekel. And those half a shekels would be used for the daily communal offerings. So every day in the temple, they would offer a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the evening. They would offer offerings that were brought as a Musaf offering. There were communal offerings that were brought, and they would buy with it also wood for the altar, for the fire. They would uh, pay for those people who bake the showbread with that money, um, the red afer, the different offerings of the holidays. There was money that was collected that was used for communal offerings. That was done in the times of the temple from the first day of Adar up to the 25th. It was optional. If it came to the 25th of Adar and you didn't bring your half a shekel, there used to be an enforcement. You would go out and enforce giving a half a shekel. Every Jew had to give a half a shekel. Now that we don't have a temple, and that mitzvah, by the way, still applies. It's not anymore a biblical mitzvah. But right now we have it as a custom to commemorate that mitzvah of the half a shekel. So Purim, before the reading of the Megillah, and usually it's done on the day when Purim falls on a regular weekday. So we do it by the fast. We are fasting the fast of Esther. So by the afternoon prayers, when we get together for the fast of Esther, we have a custom to donate 
to half a shekel. So basically, in every synagogue, you're going to have three half shekels made out of silver. In America, we have the half a silver dollar that until somewhere in the 60s, the silver half dollars still were made from actual silver. And we, every person gets a chance to lift up the three silver dollars, requires them, and then he puts it back in the, in the, in the box. And you give an exchange, you can give a dollar fifty, you can give five dollars, you can give as much as the value of three half silver shekels. Really, the half a shekel belongs to the month of Nisan, because this is when you start purchasing the new offerings for the coming year, the new lambs and the new uh, spices and the new stuff of the showbread. But a month before begins the advertisement and the announcements, and the bed dean, the court, used to go around and collect the half shekels. The Talmud tells us something really interesting that I would like to share with you. Something that happened when God Almighty commanded Moshe about this half a shekel. That Moshe had a difficult time understanding this commandment. And God Almighty says, here, let me show you. And God Almighty showed him a coin of a half a shekel minted in fire. And he said to him, as the language in the verse is, Ze itnu, give this. This means he pointed and he showed him what, how this half a shekel looked. And when you read this piece of Talmud, you wonder to yourself, suddenly Moshe doesn't know what a half a shekel is. What is so complicated with knowing what is a half a shekel? I mean, Moshe was that removed from the world that he didn't know what a half a shekel looks like? You know, we know Moshe grew up in the king's palace. And one time Moshe pulled down the king's crown. I don't know if you remember this medrash. He pulled down the king's crown and Pharaoh right away translated that this boy, it was a superstitious moment, that this boy is going to remove him from his crown. Pharaoh was getting really upset. And the Talmud says that one of the Pharaoh's ministers came and he said, let's make a test. We're going to give him one plate with gold and one plate with burning embers. And let's see, where does he with his hands and he was about to reach his hand to the goal and came angel Gabriel pushed his hands towards the coals got burned in his hands and he put his hands in his mouth and this is why Moshe's mouth was um, when he was speaking he had an impediment in his speech some say he was stuttering it wasn't a stutter his, his lips were burned from that incident so he would have his speech wasn't as clear so we see that Moshe, even as a baby, know what gold is. He knows where to reach his hands. But suddenly Moshe doesn't know what a half a shekel is. What is so difficult for Moshe to know what a half a shekel is? Why is it so hard? He never went to the store. He never, his children asked him to buy an ice cream. He never gave them a half a shekel to go uh, purchase an ice cream or something. What is it so difficult? And actually the Talmud tells us there are three things in the Torah that Moshe had a difficulty. I'm sure some of you will remember at least one of the three things that Moshe had a difficulty with. Anybody wants to turn on the microphone and tell us, what do they remember Moshe had a difficulty and got it to explain it to him? Okay, I'll say. The Talmud says there was three things that Moshe had a difficulty. Number one was the menorah. God Almighty told Moshe to build a menorah and he told him exactly all the details and all the branches and all the different crevices and the flowers and the different um, ornaments that it had. And he can't use any um, welding in any forms of, uh, you know, pieces and piece them together. It all has to be from one chunk of gold. The Talmud says Moshe didn't know how, he, how it can be done. And Hashem showed him the menorah, told him, here, 
He showed him how the menorah looks. Zema Sea Menorah. He says, he pointed at him. He says, This is how the menorah looks. Moshe didn't know how it's being done. Hashem told him, take a kikar of gold and throw it into fire. He threw it into fire, and boom, out of the fire came out the shape of the menorah. There was one thing that the Talmud says that Moshe didn't know how to do. There's another thing that the Talmud says Moshe didn't know, and that was the birth of the new moon. We learned that God, the first mitzvah that God gave Moshe was to establish a Jewish calendar. And he was trying to explain Moshe when the new moon will appear, how he's supposed to look, and Moshe wasn't understanding the whole astrology there. Until God Almighty picked him up and he showed him the moon and he says, you see this? You see the moon, how it looks? A little banana, a sliver? That's when Rosh Chodesh is. A third thing was regarding the kosher, different kosher animals. That Moshe had a hard time understanding which animals are kosher and which one is not. And God Almighty took him and he showed them all the different shratzim, all the different creepy, crawly animals, so he knew exactly to identify which animals are kosher and which are not. And when the Talmud gives us the list of those three things, the Talmud doesn't say anything about Moshe not knowing what a half shekel is. So if that was one of those things that Moshe had a difficulty with, the Talmud should have mentioned that. But instead of that, the Talmud tells us that these three things were the menorah, was the moon, and the different kosher or non-kosher animals. Those were the three things that he had a hard time with. Now, we can understand why. We can understand why. How in the world are you supposed to create a whole beautiful menorah with seven branches, with so many little ornaments and, and, and flowers and different shapes on it and cups. It was made from such a complex. How do you do that without welding, without piecing stuff together? So, so it's understood why it was difficult. Now we could also understand why the moon was difficult. Now we live on planet Earth. The moon is far away from us. How would you know which moon? And God Almighty, and we all know the calculations of astrology to know where the moon is positioned and how the moon is looking. That's complicated. We could understand it was complicated. And we could also understand the kosher and non-kosher animals. Moshe was supposed to know animals that, he, that, 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 that exist in Australia, animals that exist in South Africa, animals that exist in the Savannah or they exist in Israel. God Almighty was supposed, gave him a list of every single animal that exists anywhere in the world. Moshe's entire life was in Egypt. He spent some years in Midian. I don't think in the zoo in Egypt or in Midian, there was a variety of animals that he was able to know every single creature. I don't know Moshe visited the zoo. They were all enslaved in Egypt. I know that Moshe knew about sheep. He was, he was a shepherd. He knew about snakes because his staff turned into a snake. We knew there was a plague of the wild animals. I'm sure he saw some wild animals. Yeah. He knew about horses because Pharaoh had horses and he knew about donkeys. He knew about a lot of stuff because he was riding on a donkey with his wife and his kids. There were some animals he knew about. But God Almighty gives him a list of animals that a majority of them don't even exist in the region of the world. So we could understand that Moshe had a hard time with it. So those three things, menorah, the half a moon, the, uh, the moon, the birth of the moon, and the kosher, non-kosher animals, we could understand that Moshe had a hard time and he needed from God to give him a visual, how it looks and how you do it. But the question is, what was so hard to know what a half a shekel is? You take a shekel, cut it in half, you have a half a shekel. And the question is even more, making a whole demonstration, showing them in fire. You want to show me a half a shekel? Show me a half a shekel. Why does God Almighty says, I want to show it to you, and God Almighty shows him the half a shekel minted in fire. I want to just divert for a second to another beautiful piece of Talmud. And this is the Talmud that's connected to the holiday that we're all getting ready for, the holiday of Purim. The holiday of Purim is already reminding us that soon things are going to be good. You know, we are since Simcha's Torah, 
we are in anguish, we are worried, we don't see the light in the end of the tunnel. Haman is dominating the situation. Hamas is calling the shots. America is dragging their feet. We don't see the great miracles, the great wonders. And here we'll go about to get into the season of Purim. And we know what is Purim? Purim is Venahapahu. The Haman, the, the evil forces, turn around and get their punishment. And the Jewish people, like Yehudim, Aita, Ora, Vesimcha, Vesason, Vikar. And it fills our heart with hope. It fills my heart with hope. Knowing that we're going into a season of joy, a season of redemption, we have to really prepare our minds and hearts to the, what's coming ahead of us in the next couple of weeks in this particular season that we are going in. And our hopes are big that we're going into an era of redemption and deliverance. So there is a Talmud. One of the tractates in the Babylonian Talmud is called the Tractate of Megillah. The whole tractate is dedicated to talk about the laws and the different verses in the Megillah. Pretty fascinating. Some of them are just legalities and laws. But the Talmud brings a fascinating statement. Why are we bringing a half a shekel before Purim? Says the Talmud. Haman, when he comes to the king and he says to the king, and he wants the king to give him permission to annihilate all the Jews, what does he say to the king? I am going to give the king 10,000 kikar of silver, says Reish Lakish. God Almighty knew that Haman will come one day and he will bring shekels to purchase the permission to murder and annihilate all the Jews. Says God Almighty, you give your shekels first. He tells the Jewish people, you give your shekels first. So before Haman gets a chance to bring his shekels, your shekels already are deposited and are as president and came before them. And the question is, what was the point? What was Haman trying to do with the shekels? Says the Talmud, Haman knew that there is a sin that the Jewish people carry from the beginning of them becoming a people. And that is the sin of selling their brother Joseph when they were a family of 12 tribes, they sold their brother Joseph. And when they sold him, they sold him for 20 silver. 20 silver is five silver shekels. Yeah, each shekel from the temple is 20 silver are five silver shekels. Each one of them went home. Each one of the 10 brothers went home after selling their brother with a half a shekel in their pocket. So he knew that there is something that those Jews have done in their past that it was done through each one of them receiving a half a shekel. So he comes to the king and he says, you know what? 10,000 kikar kesef if you calculate 10,000 Kikar Kesef, and Tosfos makes a whole calculation, the 10,000 Kikar Kesef ends up being 600,000 times 50 shekel. It makes a calculation that a regular Jew from between the age of 20 and the age of 50 ends up giving a certain amount of half a shekels in their lives, together it creates this amount. Haman basically was looking to give enough money that will overweigh the half a shekels that all the Jews gave together. Haman 
when he comes to the king petitioning from the king that he wants permission to annihilate the Jewish people. We got to listen to what the anti-Semite talks. We got to put our ears really close sometimes to what our enemies are speaking. There was a book that was printed before World War II. And the name of the book is Hitler Speaks or Hitler Talks. And this was a guy who interviewed Adolf Hitler in his prison cell when Adolf Hitler was in prison as a, as a political activist. And he followed Adolf Hitler and he asked him questions and he wrote down those interviews. A lot of the stuff that exists in the book by Kampf, a lot of that stuff is encapsulated in those interviews and many more things that is not in that Mein Kampf that Hitler wrote are in that interview. And when you read that, and I'm not encouraging any one of you to read it, but sometimes it's good to read a few interesting to know what did Hitler have against the Jewish people. It's pretty awesome to read sometimes what our enemies are saying, because when you listen to our enemies, you know, what are we doing that needs to maybe be corrected, or maybe we need to enforce in ourselves. Haman comes to the king and he says to the king, and it's very, we have to be very careful to listen how he represents the king, the Jewish problem. You know, throughout history, people were looking to solve the Jewish problem. What is the Jewish problem in Haman's eyes? Says Haman to the king, Yeshno Amechad, there is one nation, Mefuzar u Meforad Beinamim. There is a nation that is scattered and separated between all the nations. What Haman is telling the king is that the Jewish people are people who are never getting along with each other. They're always fighting. They are scattered. One thing is being scattered. Another thing is every time a Jew ends up on an island, he builds two synagogues. One he goes, the other one he doesn't step foot in or he throws rocks on. The idea that Jewish people are always creating rivalries between each other. And therefore, the king has no value to keep those people alive because they're only a cause of conflict. They only cause political issues. Where did Haman get this knowledge that the Jewish people are always fighting between each other, from the story of Joseph and his brothers. This is the beginning of us as a family. This is the beginning of the Jewish people. And the story of us as a family begins with us not getting along with each other. With us fighting, one brother fighting against the other brother. So Haman comes to the king and he says to the king, this people... Don't get along with each other. These people are fighting with one another. It's not worth to keep them going. Comes Esther and tells Mordecai, how are we going to combat? How are we going to overwin Haman's claim? What does Esther say to Mordecai? Leich kenos et kol ayehudim. Go and bring together all the Jews. Esther tells Mordecai the secret. How are we going to fight Haman? Haman said, scattered, separated. They don't love each other. They're busy fighting with one another. They're busy fighting, finding in each other only problems. They are like Joseph and the brothers. Esther says to Mordecai, you want to win over Haman? Bring the Jews together. Let's gather all the Jews together. She unites the Jewish people. And that unity that she does is the greatest proof to the king that no matter what happens between us, fights, politics, rivalries, political differences, when it comes the moment of a test, 
Jews are united. In other words, what did the brothers learn from the sale of Joseph? Let's look a second. What did the brothers learn from the sale of Joseph? What they learned from the sale of Joseph was that they are really one unit. That brother who they saw no value in, that brother they were willing to sell as a slave, that brother they were willing to get rid of, that brother that they wanted to throw away, that very brother became what? The reason why they survived. If not for him, they will all die from a famine. Yosef turns out to be the leader of the universe at that time, making sure his brothers have what he needs. That kid that they tried to bury alive and he saw no value in him, that very child turns out to become the second in command to the king of Egypt and sustain them in a time of famine. When we give a half a shekel, says the Talmud, we are hinting. The idea is that every Jew is a half. We cannot be complete without another Jew. Yosef was only half of his brothers. And his brothers were only half of Yosef. And with this understanding that each and every one of us is only half, this is how we can bring unity. When a person feels like he's a complete human being, I am all, I am good, I am perfect. This is when you can look at someone else and say, what do we need you? You are broken. You are not perfect. But when God Almighty says that each and every one of us is valued half a shekel, that is the healing, this is the remedy, this is the medicine for the divisiveness between Jews, is coming in contact with our real value. You know what you really valued? You really valued a half a shekel. If you're rich, if you're poor, if you're sitting on the eastern side of the synagogue, or are you sitting in the western side of the synagogue, or you don't come to synagogue at all, or you're against the synagogue, and you're throwing stones on the synagogue, each and every one of you is worth it a half a shekel. So the unity, the love that gets established with this mitzvah, you see what Haman wants to show the king, they're all living away from each other. They're all looking to fight with one another. God Almighty says to the Jewish people, I want you to bring you a half a shekel first. So Haman can't even claim, doesn't matter how much money he throws and how much he wants to remind about the sin of the sale of Yosef, and no matter how much he wants to point out the Jews hate each other and the Jews are problematic to one another, by you bringing a half a shekel, you already put down the statement that every Jew believes that he is half, and only with a fellow Jew he can become complete. By the way, this is the secret for any happy marriage or any great relationship between a father and his children or between each other. When a person believes that he is complete and the other person in his life, if it's his spouse or his children, are just, you know, extras. I'm already complete. I'm perfect. I'm orthodox. I'm a rabbi. You know, I have all those books behind me. I'm fine. And therefore, what is your job? Your job is just to kind of like be extras in my life so I could fill in my boredom so I have you guys hanging out with me. When a person doesn't feel that the other Jew is his other half, when a husband doesn't feel that his wife is his other half, no matter if he calls her his other better half or his better other half or whatever you want to Call it, or you look at your children, you know, my children are there to fix the parts in me that are still missing by me spending time with a challenging child that I have. My son, my daughter is giving me a hard time. And I look at them and I say, thank you for reminding me what I have to still repair in my life. If not for you challenging me that way, I would have never grown. 
instead of accusing the child for giving him a hard time, instead of accusing our children for, for, for bringing out in us all sorts of sides that we want to forget, we have to be grateful that our kids reminded us about those halves in our lives that they came to the universe. They came to us as a gift. By the way, they didn't come to the neighbor. They came to your house to be your children, to complement the half that you still have to co accomplish in this world. And this is the great secret of the half a shekel. As the Talmud says, God says to the Jews, bring your half a shekel before Haman brings his shekels. Before Haman is talking about divisiveness and the Jewish problems, and this, the Jews are fighting between each other, let's point out how each and every one of us really feels. Each and every one of us feels half when it comes to someone else. And now we're coming to the next piece. Why was Moshe having such a hard time with this? What was Moshe's problem? Remember the question we asked, why was Moshe so difficult not understanding what is a half a shekel? We asked that question in the beginning of tonight's lesson. Why was it so difficult? Why does God Almighty have to show him the half a shekel in fire? Minted in fire. Just show him a half a shekel. If he really doesn't know what it is, put your hands in your pocket and show him a half a shekel. Why does God Almighty have to show him they have a shekel minted in fire? So let us really understand what was Moshe's question. Some commentaries want to say Moshe's question was how can I convince a Jew to take out a half a shekel and donate? You know what a half a shekel is? Half a shekel is a lot of money. People worked hard. They earned. They made their income. And now I have to convince each and every one of them to give a half a shekel. How will this ever happen? That every single one of them will give a half a shekel? You're talking about even poor people have to give it. Not only rich people. These the rich people are going to give a half a shekel. Fine. But this is a mitzvah that even poor people have to give. But one of the commentaries that I saw says something very beautiful. God shows him the coin in fire. You know that everything in the world, when you take from it, yeah, if you go over to the ocean and you take out a cup of water, from now on there's going to be a cup of water missing in the ocean. Even though you have a vast ocean, that's massive body of water. But if you take one cup of water from the ocean, from now on, there's going to be an ocean missing a cup of water. If you go to the shore and you take a cup of sand, even though there is billions of grains of sand, you took a cup of sand from now on, all the sand in the universe is missing one cup because you took it. Anything physical that a person takes from, from the world, automatically, yeah, you ate one apple, you ate it, you digest it, it became part of you. From now on, the world is missing an apple. Where is the apple? Where is that apple? Shem is looking for the apple that he created. Oh, Michael ate it. Michael, where's my apple? I ate it. Who gave you permission? What do you mean you gave permission? I said a bracha. Oh, you said a bracha fine. That's by the way, the Talmud says that God Almighty is looking for the food that he created. And the only reason we can go and take it and digest it and enjoy it, says the Talmud, is that we say a blessing. The blessing that we say on food, acknowledging that the food came from Hashem, that blessing makes the food permissible for us. If not, you steal. If you take something from the world and you eat it, digest it, enjoy it, you are stealing from the owner. The owner of the world is the one who created it, God Almighty. And the only way he gives you permission to enjoy it is when you can pause and say, Baruch Hato Hashem Alokeinu Malach HaOlam, Torah Priya Eitz. And then you bite into the apple. Phew, my apple ended up where it belongs. But going back to the idea is that everything we take from this physical world, everything we take from this physical world, what ends up being, the world is missing something. 
What is the only thing that when you take from the world actually multiplies? Not only it's not missing, you created more. And that is fire. You have one candle burning, and then you go and you light from that candle. You can light another candle, and another candle, and another candle, and you have more light, and more light, and more light. And the original candle didn't become diminished. The original candle remained with the same flame, with the same fire, nothing missing by giving. The first original candle lit millions of candles, thousands of candles, and he didn't become less by that. God Almighty tells Moshe, I want to show you how that coin is a coin minted in fire. Meaning to say, tell the Jews that giving away the half a shekel is not a diminishing of their income. It's not a way of losing money. The opposite. This is money that comes from fire. This is something that you could have give and nothing will be missing in your giving. It's a beautiful teaching that I saw one of the commentaries explain. But here I want to come and bring you to the most beautiful, inspiring explanation that Hasidus teaches us. What was God Almighty explaining Moshe and what was difficult for Moshe to understand? Moshe didn't have a problem with what is a half a shekel. Okay? Moshe knew very well what gold is. Moshe's question is, what is the value of giving a half a shekel? Three times God says in this reading, God willing, when you read it on Shabbos, we read it last week, it's part of the Torah reading, and this week we read it as a separate Torah reading. Three times God says that this half a shekel is there to atone for your soul. Lechaper al Three times it says the word lechaper al And the question of Moshe that is bewildered and wondering, how can giving a half a shekel atone the soul of a human being? What has to do physical money with the spirit and the soul of a person? How do you engulf? How do you inspire? How do you take a sinner who just built a golden calf, who just rebelled against God, who just did the most awful form of idolatry? How do we take a sinner and we say, you could atone your soul by what? By giving a half a shekel. How does it work? How does it work that a broken spirit, a shattered spirit, gets lifted up by giving a half a shekel? Came God Almighty and said to Moshe, here, come, I want to show you. Let me show you how. And what is God showing him? He's showing him the coin, the half a shekel, but the half a shekel is minted in fire. It's minted in fire. It's not what you're giving. It's how you're giving the half a shekel. Yes, a half a shekel maybe could be insignificant compared to the enormous sin that you just did. The half a shekel could mean something really trivial for the rich man. And it can mean a lot for the poor man. It's not about the amount. It's not about the coin. It's about the fire that the coin is minted in. What does it mean? When that coin is given with a fire of love towards God, when that coin is given with a yearning, with a decision that the giver gives, I want to get close to Hashem after what I just messed up in my life. And that coin is going to be given from the essence of my being. That coin is going to be an expression of my inner radiant neshama from the soul of my being. That 
way of giving, not what you give. What you give, Moshe knew. But when you give that half a shekel, you're giving it with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your being, with all the passion. You're bringing in your neshama into it. Then the half a shekel carries that value of what the half a shekel has to accomplish. What is a sin? A sin is a result of a dullness. No person sins with a conscious mind. The sin always happens when we are tired and sluggish and lonely and lazy. And we already feel bad about ourselves, about who we are and what we are and down on ourselves and all this inner dialogue of, of, of self-deprecating language that we call ourselves, I'm a loser, I'm a this, I'm a that. Usually this is where sin gets created. Out of a place of coldness, out of a place of laziness, sluggishness, lack of life. When a person is lifeless, this is when a person sins. We forget about a relationship with God. We forget about our connection to Hashem. We forget that we even have a soul that is thundering in our heart, that is sending rays of light all around us. This is the time when we sin. But in the moment we re-inspire ourselves, in the moment we engulf our heart with the love to Hashem, in the moment we remember that we have an Hashemah, just that memory, knowing I have a beautiful godly soul that's sitting right here, a spark of Hashem in me. I am a beloved child of God. This is who I am. In the moment you reclaim the love and connection with Hashem, it wipes away any ounce of that remnant of that sin. The half a shekel was the fire that the half a shekel had in it. The warmth, the soul that was infused in the half a shekel. In this week's parasha, we have two expressions about generosity. And it's very interesting that the Torah uses these two different ways of describing generous people. One of them is called Nediv Lev. And then there's another one called Nasa Libo. One of them means, in translation into English, anyone who is heart is generous. And then there's another thing is, Anyone who is spirit is generous. Nediv Rucho Venasa Libo. Nediv Rucho means a spirit of generosity. Venasa Libo means his heart is lifted. Both of them expressions regarding giving. Because Moshe in this week's parish of Ayakil, Moshe God is the Jewish people, and he talks about the mitzvah of building the tabernacle, and he's telling the Jews about the mitzvah of bringing all those donations that they needed. And then the Torah describes what happened as a result of that. Everyone who had a spirit of giving and an uplifted heart came and brought gold and silver and copper. And the Talmudic sages are discussing, the commentary is discussing, what are those two titles? Why can't you just say generous? Anyone who is generous gave a donation. What is the two forms of generosity? One of them is a spirit of generosity, Nadiv Lev, and the other one is anyone who is Naso Rucho, Naso Libo, his heart is lifted up. And I saw one of the commentaries, the Orachayim Kadosh, is a beautiful explanation. He says there are two types of generosity. There is a generosity based on the amount of money you have in the bank. The person who has an excess amount of money and your generosity is based on your ability to give. You have a lot of money, you give a lot of money. You have a little bit of money, you give a little bit of money. He says this is the meaning of spirit of generosity. Spirit of generosity means you give and you're generous based on what you are able to. 
He says, then there is a level of generosity where a person, his heart is lifting him up. There are people who don't have so much money. But when you ask them to give, they give an amount of money that is a much more than you ever estimated or they even estimate themselves they can give. It's a donation that doesn't come from what's going on in the bank account. It's a donation that comes from their heart lifts them up to a place that their giving carries in it a whole different energy. And suddenly they're becoming more capable than they were ever to give something that's way above their price. There's a story about this rabbi, Mayor Shapiro, who was building a yeshiva in Lublin in, the, in, in Europe. And he was going around collecting money. And every time he, he was a great fundraiser, there's a lot of beautiful fundraising stories about him. He built one of the most beautiful yeshivas who got destroyed in the Holocaust. And he arrived to a town and he was estimating, you know, which people can give what. He was sitting down with the leaders of the community and they, they went through names. This one can give this, this one can give that. And he starts knocking on doors. He comes to the house of this Yid and he was a very well-known uh, Talmudic sage and a person with a little bit of money. And as they go in, tells him about this great dream that he's going to build a yeshiva in Lublin. There's going to be hundreds of yeshiva students learning. And the man gets inspired and he, write, he tells him, I am promising 500 zloty. Zloty was the Polish money. I'm, I'm, I'm promising 500 zloty. So the mayor says to him, you know, I actually estimated you for 300 zloty. I'm very impressed that you gave such a large donation. So he responded and he said, you estimated me by the amount of money that you know I have. But you never estimated me according to my heart. According to my heart, the inspiration in my heart causes me to want to give a lot more of what I have. Says the Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, he says, where in the world do the Jewish people learn how to work with gold and silver and diamonds? Where, where do they have all that education? I know our friend Albin Aliyah is, is, he creates stuff out of wood and out of silver and he's what's called a hacham lev. He knows how to create all sorts of interesting uh, mezuzah cases and he fixes the crowns of the Torah and he creates bells for the Torah. Yeah, some people have trained themselves to do fine jewelry and stuff but Nachmanides asks a very interesting question. He says where were there in the desert time or where was it in the time of Egypt where did they learn how to engrave and polish diamonds and fix gold and silver? First of all, the only thing we know their occupation was in Egypt was to build bricks and, and work with mortar and, 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 and bricks. Where did they learn all of that? Says the Ramban, an incredible teaching. He says, when Moshe said, Yidin, we need to go build a home for Hashem. Who knows how to create beautiful tapestries? Who knows how to engrave in gold? People who had zero education in it were so passionate to come and build a home for Hashem that somehow that inspiration caused them to bring out from within themselves powers that they themselves didn't even know they have. They were born artists by the moment. It was such an exciting opportunity to build a home for Hashem. People who never knew they were artists suddenly became artists overnight. And Maimonides, Nachmanides says that this is the beautiful thing. When your heart is open, when someone is inspired, he can do things that you can never imagine he can do. People suddenly become musicians. People become artists, people become, and people who work with diamonds and with gold and creating gorgeous things. Who educated them that? He says no one had to. There were people who were naturally were born with those gifts, but because they were stifled for so long, they never had an opportunity to even show it. And in the second Hashem says we build a temple, people showed up and they became artists. They became 
craftsmen. They became people who can do amazing things. Such a powerful teaching. What happens when a heart of a Jew is open? When someone is inspired, we can do impossible things. Things that we ourselves don't believe we can do. Suddenly, we out of our fingers comes out this magic, comes out this incredible things. What is it? He says, this is the meaning, nasa libo. There is one thing who is generous out of based on this calculation. I have in my bank account so and so money. The rabbi is asking for a donation based on what I have in my bank account. If I write him a check of a hundred dollars, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it, and the rabbi will be happy and everything will be fine. But then there's people who become inspired to give, and that giving brings out in a person certain powers and certain energies that the person himself didn't know. That was the fire of the half a shekel. God Almighty shows motion. He says, there is a half a shekel and there is a half a shekel. You're right. How can a person give a half a shekel and suddenly all his sin gets wiped out? Especially a sin like the golden girl. Says Hashem to Moshe, this is not just a half a shekel. This is a half a shekel that comes from a place of inspiration. From love. It's a half a shekel that comes from a heart of a Jew who wants to be closer to Hashem and he's regretting what he did and he feels bad about what he have done and he's not just guilty. He comes with the interest and the desire. He knows I belong to be one with Hashem. How can I do that? And Moshe tells him, give a half a shekel and you'll do it. And the Yid brings the half a shekel and he dances his way with a half a shekel. His heart is engulfed in fire with a half a shekel. He can't sleep the night before. Tomorrow I'm going to bring a half a shekel to God. Tomorrow morning he's going to do this. The excitement, the passion, the fire. Hashem says to Moshe, you see the fire? That's all what it is. You know, we I grew up with, with people in my life that when they knew that tomorrow morning we're going to shake the lulav, because it's going to be the first day of Sukkot. A whole night they were sitting, waiting for the sun to rise so they can go finally and shake the lulav. You saw the excitement of a mitzvah. Yom Tev came weeks before. They were coming and going and talking about the matzah and what type of matzah they're buying. And they were so involved and passionate. And the sitting at the Seder, you were able to see they're holding the matzahs and their hands are shaking from excitement. They're going to eat the matzah that Hashem gave us. Unfortunately, the busyness of the industrial world that we live in and the distractions and the noise, we don't have that type of a gift these days to see people are in, on fire when it comes to a mitzvah. We still see some of them. But God Almighty reminds us with this half a shekel, it reminds us that idea, bring the half a shekel, but bring it with fire. How do we create excitement? How do we create this vibration? How do we create this mitzvah should come with so much heat and excitement? Comes the Alter Rebbe in Tanya and he says, the heart has a certain rhythm that the only way that rhythm changes is if the mind is being influencing it. Simple teaching of Moach Shalit Alalev. The mind inspires the heart. You got to pause and create an awareness. If you are running around and your phones are buzzing and the computers are beeping and the children are yelling and you have nowhere to go, yes, the half a shekel is just going to be a silver half a shekel. There's not going to be any inspiration there. But before a holiday comes, before a mitzvah comes, take a moment. Find yourself a quiet space. Contemplate. Contemplate what are you being gifted right now to do. Be mindful. Yom Tev is coming. Shabbos is coming. Kiddush is going to be made. Tomorrow morning I'm going to put on tefillin. Take a moment before you put on tefillin. And ask yourself, what am I doing right now? Boruch Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam. 
Asher Kiddushanu b'mitzvotav, you sanctify us. I have a moment that I become sanctified. I, me, piece of flesh and blood and veins and bones become sanctified with God's commandment who commanded me to lay the tefillin. And I take the tefillin that Hashem's name is written on it, commanded by Hashem, and my physical hands are feeling the tightness of the tefillin and my physical brain is surrounded with the tightness of the tefillin. And I close my physical eyes and I use my physical mouth and I say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. My being, my entire Barry Farkash, the physical human being became for a moment a vehicle for Hashem. My body is carrying Hashem's name in the forms of tefillin. My hands are tied with the tefillin. My mouth is saying, Shema Yisrael. Just be aware of what you're doing right now. Get off your phone. Get off your bubamises. You are right now having an opportunity to connect to Hashem himself. And when a person spends a moment to create an awareness of where he is and what he's doing, that will awaken the fire. That will awaken the inspiration. And especially as we're getting ready for our holiday, preparing yourself, Purim is coming. What does Purim mean to me? How will I need to be inspired for Purim? Same thing with Pesach. What does the matzah mean? What does the four cups of wine mean? Sitting in that place where you're allowing yourself to open your mind. And that opening of the mind, that pause, that little meditational moment, inspires your heart to feel the connection. We have to elevate and upgrade our relationship with God. This parasha Shekalim reminds us that God Almighty is waiting for a half a shekel. You might not do the things perfectly. You might do only half. You might not do things perfectly. But God wants that that imperfection that you're doing Infuse it with a fire of love. You might not be capable to become ultra, ultra, perfectly done orthodox according to every halacha and minhag. It's going to be half. But let that half be engulfed in fire. This is where you reach your completion. This is where you reach your wholeness. The idea of showing up in our religious observances wholeheartedly. Haman doesn't know how to deal with that. Haman's power is only when he can find the fights between the Jews, the divisiveness between the Jews, the politics between the Jews. That's the field where he feels comfortable to, to create the trouble. We have the secret. And the secret and the answer for all of that is to infuse our life with the fire of God, with the fire of mitzvahs, with the fire of Torah. You're giving a half a shekel. Don't belittle that half a shekel. Even though you are a rich man, and what is a half a shekel to you? Don't play it down. Give the half a shekel with a vibrating of fire in you. That's how we're going to reach that allness the completion that we all have to reach. God Almighty bless us that as we are blessing this month, the month of Adar, we should nichnas Adar marbim besimcha. If Adar comes in, we have to increase in joy. We should have a month full of joy, a month full of happiness, simcha by each and every one of us. All our hearts should be completed with the true simcha, simcha of the upcoming redemption through Mashiach Tzitkenu.